Scientists are now searching through the genes of our persecutors to discover the secrets of their worrying adaptive capacity. Researchers have recently discovered that the first dose of blood changes how certain insects' genes express in hematophage insects, otherwise known as bloodsuckers. This change leads to a considerable strengthening of the cuticle of the bedbug, the louse, the crab, and the tick. Once thickened, the cuticle becomes a kind of extremely resistant armor which protects the insects from aggression, physical as well as chemical. The resistance of bloodsuckers to insecticides rests in their genes that stimulate the detoxification system. This is very developed in insects because it's their principal defense against plants which try to kill them. So as not to be eaten, plants developed a system which allowed them to produce toxins, and in response, plant-eating insects also developed proteins which are capable of biodegrading these toxins, and nowadays mosquitoes have inherited through evolution these proteins which they can also use to degrade insecticide molecules. It's very effective, and that has allowed some populations to resist very strong doses of insecticide. The chemical products used to destroy hematophage are the equivalent of the poisons developed by plants to defend themselves and which the insects learnt to neutralize. Our genetic research has allowed us to better understand this detoxification that mosquitoes use to resist insecticide and so how to counter this phenomenon. What's certain is it's impossible to eradicate mosquitoes so we'll have to adapt to our lifestyle. Genetics can be used in another way. Researchers have found that male mosquitoes can be genetically modified so that their progeniture don't develop. When they are released in great numbers into the environment, it's seen that, statistically, Wild females tend to couple with the laboratory males rather than wild males. This coupling being sterile, the spread of mosquitoes is slowed. There are already transgenic mosquitoes in laboratories. There are already transgenic mosquitoes being used to fight with, for example, in South America, in Brazil, or in Australia, where small-scale releases have been made. This method is effective, but playing with genetic modification remains the prerogative of the English-speaking world. In French-speaking environments, this isn't at the forefront because there's a certain resistance to using these ways of fighting. Currently, the European Union forbids the use of transgenic mosquitoes based on the principle of precaution and action against genetic modification. The Research Institute for Development, the IRD, is piloting an alternative project which sterilizes male tiger mosquitoes by radiation. Millions of sterilized male tiger mosquitoes are awaiting the green light to go into action. Releases by drone are being trialed in South America. Each flight releases 50,000 treated male mosquitoes over a zone of around 20 hectares. Other alternatives rely upon the natural predators of these creatures. In North America, the return of bat colonies to urban zones is favored. In one night, a single chiropteran can devour over 2,000 mosquitoes. There are predators for bed bugs, which are centipedes that kill them. But releasing centipedes in a house isn't possible. So biological warfare against bed bugs is very complicated. Once, the tick population was, amongst other things, regulated by many predators, amongst which were insect-eating mammals, some birds, lizards, toads and amphibians. When game was more widely hunted, the deer population was a lot less, and there were a lot less ticks. 
It's a problem that there are more than 300 animal species that can carry ticks, reptiles, hares, rodents and birds which spread ticks a lot. But the biggest part of the problem at the moment is the deer population. They offer a large blood mass for ticks and they can't get rid of ticks by scratching at them. Natalie Boulanger and Jack Aberea want to reintroduce indirect predators, which, by regulating the presence of game, would much reduce the spread of ticks. Speaking as a forester for 30 or 40 years, there's really an infestation of game, and it doesn't surprise me at all that there's an infestation of ticks coming from that. The predators absolutely have to return. We once had the lynx, which was a great predator, but which is disappearing because we've made it disappear, and the wolf, which is returning, and it's very important to let the wolves return because they're great predators, and that's the only way to limit the game and fauna to a normal level. Here's a game trail, more like a game highway. You can see an old deer spore there. Well, you see, to collect ticks, I tend to use these trails as well. And like that, I can collect a fair amount of ticks. Here, you see, I have a tube with around 150 that I collected in about an hour. Well, well. And all these ticks have fallen from the deer and other animals which are nearby. Mm -hmm. The number of hunters continues to fall, and natural predators have been more or less eradicated. Large game will therefore continue to spread ticks. Researchers have not given up looking for biological ways of fighting and have turned to solutions which were proven in the past. For centuries, the inhabitants of the Balkans have covered the ground around their beds with bean leaves to defend themselves against all sorts of attackers, snails, slugs, and plant-eating insects. Bean leaves are covered with trichomes. These are microscopic sharp hairs upon which the insects impale themselves and die. Researchers are trying to develop a synthetic surface which has the same characteristics as this spiky plant trap. You can also use diatomaceous earth. Silica, it's a crystal mineral. It's sharp and will cause microhemorrhages in bedbugs. It kills them, not immediately. It's not instantaneous, but in four to five days they'll die. The problem is, it's silica, and you mustn't breathe it in. Confronted with the recent wave of bedbugs, putting furniture and contaminated objects in a hot chamber has been very effective, and this is being developed. So, we find chairs and we find mattresses, and all that represents about 15 days of treatment for bed bugs. And in peak period, we can get five to six times that quantity. The procedure is relatively recent, and research is continuing to know more exactly the temperatures at which steaming is the most effective for each category of parasite. With chemical products, it takes a month of treatment, and there's also a problem of toxicity for people. Chemical products are put in a house with children playing on the floors, and all those problems we're trying to fix now more and more by a mechanical attack, especially using heat and cold. In a morning, and at most a day, the problem is solved. Jean-Michel Béranger puts test bed bugs and a temperature gauge in the furniture which goes into the chamber. Our research shows that it takes a temperature of at least 48 degrees to exterminate bed bugs. In our research, we're trying to be as economical as possible, which means using cold or heat, but at the right levels. In winter, we can cool things down, which allows us to save energy, because in winter the things are already cold and it's quicker to get to negative temperatures.
Thanks to this mobile heat chamber, we can go directly to the base of the apartments to treat with heat or cold social environments, hotels, everything which has bed bugs for sure, but also fleas, mites, and any insect which can infest an apartment or a building. It's really a treatment of the future. It's very fast and it's almost organic. The CO2 of our breathing is a signal which attracts many bloodsuckers, but it's not the only one. Mosquitoes and bedbugs are very sensitive to the odorous molecules of our body. The idea of using this attraction as a biological trap isn't new. In the 1970s, the odor of armpits was synthesized and a substrate made to bait mosquitoes. In the 90s, entomology professor Willem Tacken from the Research Center of the University of Wageningen in Holland became very interested in using the smell of feet with the same objective. Right now, we're testing new types of trap which associate a temperature of 37 degrees, human odor and CO2. For the CO2, we insert a pellet in the trap, and for the odor, this product which smells really, really bad, here I'm testing it on bed bugs. But the same stimuli attract other blood suckers, like mosquitoes, for example. Here we can see clearly that it's more efficient with three stimuli than one. Here the temperature. But despite the efficiency of this type of trap, we can't eradicate bed bugs in a house or an apartment. It's an interesting approach because it reproduces a decoy, a human guinea pig. In Germany, American Larry Hansen relies on the smell of bed bugs to track them. He has created a dog unit which inspects planes to detect bed bugs which have embarked unseen in suitcases. Using a dog to find bed bugs is one of the best ways to find them. That the dog has an access rate of 95%. Frankfurt Airport, since 2018, is the only one to have this type of service. But the problem is getting bigger, so I really think that every airport should offer it to their customers. Direct ran? Direct? Come on. We have a, a lot of people who use our service. We have airlines that use us to search the airplanes, and we also have customers that come with their luggage and ask us to search their luggage with our dogs. It, it's exploded. It's been gone way up. Hi. 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 How are you? Very well. Hi. Nice to meet we you. We just need to go around the corner here, and then we can search the right. bag. OK, we can do it right here, sir, if it's all right with you. Check. Good search. So he smells something, sir. Bed bug pheromones have little smell, but the dog can identify the smell of pheromones anyway and looks for that odor of a live bed bug in the baggage. And when it finds a bed bug, it lies down. Larry Hansen doesn't look after the decontamination. He tells the passenger that the baggage is infested and it's up to them to get it treated. The problem with the bed bugs is increasing because you can travel throughout Europe with the train and with an airplane very cheap now. So the Europe has become a small town and that's why the problem is becoming bigger. Climate warming will continue, and the old can of insecticide of grandmother, as toxic for us as it is for insects, has to be definitively forgotten. The numerous studies which have been made, especially in the domain of genetics, should lead to effective solutions in terms of prevention and fighting. But when? While waiting, we're going to have to learn to live with these squatters that we don't know much about. We can't dream about eradicating them from the surface of the Earth. That's a fantasy which is completely anthropocentric. We'll have to live together to control the risk 
and act to manage it rather than try and fight it. Whatever the problems and the perils that living together brings for us, don't panic. It's not the end of the world. While Lyme disease is much talked about in the media, specialists are keeping their cool. More and more people are bitten by ticks, but amongst the ticks present in the environment, only 10 to 20 percent are infected. And amongst the people who are bitten, only 2 to 4 percent will develop Lyme disease. You have to see things relatively and not go crazy after a tick bite. As for bedbugs, the situation is under control and being closely watched. In the world, every day, millions of people are bitten by bedbugs without any consequences. In the laboratory, they can transmit viruses or bacteria, so we have to remain very vigilant. Scratching our skin and swearing at the creatures that persecute us is written into the destiny of the human race. Our ancestors scratched more than we do nowadays, and our descendants will scratch as well. <laughs>